Welcome to the Matt Waller Podcast, where we look at success at the intersection of technology, logistics, supply chain, retail, and CPG, also known as the retail value chain. I want to clarify that this podcast is distinct from my responsibilities as a professor in the Sam M. Walton College of Business. Nonetheless, it aligns with my aspiration to provide practical insights to professionals and business by showcasing companies and people that can enhance your ability to manage, lead, and strategize and market effectively in the retail value chain. Before we dive into today's exciting episode, I'd like to thank our sponsor, New Road Capital Partners. New Road invests in proven technology, services, and products that serve unmet needs in the marketplace. They look for companies in supply chain and logistics, as well as consumer-oriented companies. For more information, go to newroadcp.com. I would also like to disclose that I am a strategic advisor to New Road. I'd also like to recognize podcastvideos.com for the services they provide for these podcasts. I'm very pleased with their services. And now without further ado, let's get into the exciting episode. I have with me today, Josh Jewett, and he has over 30 years of experience in IT. He's been CIO of major corporations like Dollar Tree, uh, Family Dollar, and others. And our conversation is really interesting. We're looking at how technology affects the retail value chain, what trends are occurring, uh, what kinds of capabilities CIOs need to have uh, going forward uh, to succeed. We talk about the importance of um, computer uh, and AI-driven computer vision and uh, the importance of visibility in the retail value chain. We also talk about mergers and acquisitions and uh, integrating different IT systems. Uh, what kinds of skills and capabilities do CIOs need? It's a really interesting conversation, and we do talk about the use of AI. We talk about um, concepts around self-checkout um, and the use of uh, compute, completely uh, independent uh, self-checkout where people aren't even having to do anything. But what are the what's the value of this computer vision in that kind of a setting. and uh, But Josh has incredible experience. Right now, he is an operating partner at New Road Capital Partners, and he leverages his experience in retail and supply chain technology uh, for sourcing and assessing new investment opportunities um, and, and also advising portfolio companies post-investment. Uh, I've actually witnessed him doing that, and uh, he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, he also founded a consulting firm called CIO Advisory Services to help clients optimize their operations and achieve strategic objectives through successful application of technology. He has extensive experience leading large-scale IT transformations as CIO, as Dollar Tree's CIO, he consolidated systems after the acquisition of an $11 billion competitor, uh, reducing costs for the combined enterprise while improving performance. He also spearheaded digital e-commerce and supply chain initiatives. And actually, one of the things we talk about um, in, in the podcast today uh, is th the trends around e-commerce and digitization and his insights are, are really good. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, earlier, as Family Dollar's CIO, Jewett supported the company through its most aggressive growth phase, significantly augmenting the business application portfolio, establishing offshore teams to augment skill sets and capabilities and capacity, and adopting new technical architectures and implementing innovative solutions across merchandising, supply chain, and marketing. Uh, and I think all of this experience of his will really come through when you hear me ask him some pretty tough questions uh, that are relevant to IT and technology and the retail value chain. Um, he also holds a BA in history from Dartmouth College 
I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. So, Josh, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks a lot for having me, Matt. So, Josh, you have a tremendous amount of experience as a CIO and in retail, and you have seen all kinds of technology disruption in the retail value chain. Would you just talk about that a little bit? What kind of disruption has there been, and how is it changing how retailers have to operate? Uh, yeah, there, there certainly has been quite a lot in, in my time. I mean, the two areas that come come to mind, I think, that are most significant are the transparency of your supply chain. It's not possible like it never was before to uh, understand where your purchase orders are from factory, from point of origin, all the way through the back door of the store. Uh, you can get telemetry data off of uh, containers and cases, cartons, pallets. Uh, you can uh, track your goods through the supply chain, understand if they're going to hit uh, various uh, supply chain nodes when they're supposed to hit those nodes and whether you're going to get the merchandise on time to meet your sales plan. Um, that's made retailers a lot more nimble in understanding their sourcing and their supply chain and, and how their operations are going to work out for, for key events, holiday events in particular. I think the second area that I think of is digital customer engagement. Uh, and of course, uh, retailers now, like uh, never before, are able to, even brick and mortar retailers are be beginning to identify first party customer transactions, understand those customers, create catered experiences to those consumers, not just online, but also through localization of their assortments and brick and mortar retailers. Uh, and that kind of customer insight has just gotten better and better in recent years. And it's really uh, forced retailers to change the way they think about their assortment, the way they manage their assortment, and ultimately, of course, their supply chain that delivers that assortment. So, Josh, I understand that you're on the board of advisors of a supply chain visibility technology provider. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. That's a company called uh, SmartSense. It's, uh, it's a division of Digi, and it's a, co it's a co company that provides uh, or you can use your own devices, but it provides devices that you can put on perishable products uh, that you can track th through your supply chain so that you understand uh, sort of the chain of custody of those items. You can understand their temperature, have they been dropped, the humidity of the container that they were in. And back to my point about visibility, this is really actually tr providing transparency into the health of your supply chain and the safety of your product. And it allows you actually to mitigate a lot of risk, not just track your deliveries, but also mitigate risk around those deliveries. So, Josh, what industries or companies do you see as doing the most innovative work uh, across the retail value chain in terms of how they're using uh, technology across the retail value chain? Yeah, there's a company that just filed for an IPO called Chain. And it's a, a, a colossal retailer that's uh, uh, emerged out of the last uh, five or 10 years. It now rivals some of the biggest retailers uh, in, in America, The Gap, uh, and, and other large apparel retailers. Uh, and it, uh, it sells apparel. It sells a lot of different categories, but mostly it's focused on its, on its apparel. And the way it uses technology is pretty innovative. It's, uh, it, it, it delivers products directly from factories to the consumer for a mild uh, a shipping cost. And it so therefore, what it's able to do is it reads, it promotes a lot of products online on their, on their websites and then through some other digital channels. When customers select those devices, those orders go directly to the factory, the factory produces those and sends them directly to the consumer. And that what that does is it uh, reduces a significant amount of inventory risk for the retailer. It allows them to try a lot of different items without investing in those products or those raw materials. And it allows this, the, the, them to uh, immediately remove things from the assortment that they publish online that aren't popular. So they're actually tying together digital marketing and, and direct factory sourcing like uh, no other retailers that I've seen do recently. I mean, as you're well aware, Matt, the traditional model is the merchants will uh, make an educated guess as to what the consumers are going to buy next season uh, or next year, even in some cases, depending upon what 
what product we're talking about. They risk that inventory uh, investment. And then at the end of the season, they invariably have a certain amount of markdowns uh, to to address and liquidate product and free up working capital to 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 start the process all over again. And this type of new retail model uh, is is the ultimate evolution of a lot of miniature steps along the way over that, that retailers have made over recent years to understand demand signal and be much more nimble in their response. Uh, it's not unlike what other manufacturers have done in other industries. Like Dell is was an expert at just in time inventory production for its uh, its CPUs and other products that it generated. It it, it really emphasized having as little uh, in inventory in its supply chain as possible, so that it could meet the demand without having to overinvest in inventory. And this is a, this is bringing that kind of concept and that idea to retail. And I think it's one of the reasons that they, they, they've grown so quickly, and they can do so uh, profitably. What country did they start in? Do you know? I believe they started here in the U.S. And they're now in 150 countries. I just looked and saw. Pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing business. And if you have not heard of it, I guarantee you, young people in your life have. I I was thinking about asking my kids about that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Josh, one challenge. CIOs have a lot of times is partnering with business leaders in their organization to determine what technologies to acquire, where to invest in, in, in technology. What advice do you have for them about that? Yeah, well, so I would say having done it for for a couple of decades, it, there's a uh, there's more art than there is science to it, um, uh, but I think the way I approached it was on an annual basis. Sometimes this is revisited, revisited by the board periodically, but generally speaking, on an annual basis, the board is setting certain high-level priorities for the business. Some of those are financial, some of those are strategic, some of those are competitive positioning, whatever the, the slate of corporate strategies are for the year. That's sort of a top-down approach to what you really should be doing as an executive team. Uh, the bottoms up approach is actually working with each individual departmental leader uh, on their individual departmental initiatives, their departmental roadmap. Now those two should reinforce one another, or rather the departmental roadmaps should advance the overall corporate themes. And I think the CIO is in a rare position in that he or she is, is, is working across all lines of business uh, like no other uh, re- business leader in the company. And your job is to make those business leaders successful. And so uh, my uh, relationship with them was to help them build out their roadmap. Uh, my responsibility to the board and CEO was to be sure that those roadmaps uh, uh, tied in to the overall corporate objectives of the company. Sometimes those uh, individual departmental initiatives might be in conflict, or they might not be entirely uh, uh, collaborative or reinforcing. And the CEO would look to me to uh, to work through that with my peer group. And if there were some sort of dispute that um, my CEO had to had to resolve, he would often look to me for for advice and, and guidance once again, because I, you have that sort of unique role as a CIO where you can look across the enterprise. So the, the, to sum it up, I would say my best advice to CIOs is work actively in support of your business units, think about the board directives, tie those into the departmental initiatives, and then uh, use a what I would describe as a portfolio management approach to how you invest in the business. Because I guarantee you, if you added up all those departmental initiatives, uh, the company would not give you uh, the capital required to execute all those initiatives. And even if they did, you probably wouldn't have the IT resources capable of executing. Uh, so you then have to prioritize those initiatives. And I used the capital committee to do this, to manage the portfolio. And we really focused on four investment objectives when we thought about these departmental initiatives. Were we growing the top line of the business? Were we, and this is assuming that they tie into corporate strategy. So I should have said that already. Um, but assuming they did, then to prioritize them, you would say, is this growing the top line? Is it improving the bottom line? Is it improving the productivity and efficiency of the business, reducing friction in the business, which so often technology can do, or is it mitigating risk? Now, some initiatives obviously can touch on more than one, but generally there's a primary investment objective 
for the departmental initiative. And we would use that kind of framework and that thought process to create a portfolio of initiatives uh, to, to execute in, in the following, following capital cycle, the following budgetary year. There are so many <clears throat> changes going on in technology, retail, CPG. The dynamism is unbelievable at this point. And you know, people always say things are changing faster than they used to, and it's always true. Things are always changing faster than they used to. Um, and, uh, but I'm curious, since you have visibility to so much of this, what trends are you most excited about, especially in terms of like supply chain di digitization, um, AI, analytics, uh, e-commerce, and and how do you see those trends affecting retail in the future? Uh, yeah, so, so great question, and, and I would agree. Things do seem to be moving far more quickly. Uh, I say that, once again, the digitization of the supply chain, the ability for brands to understand their demand, uh, understand customer demand signal, and sourcing capacity. Um, I think that's what's really come online in recent years. Retailers have had to get much better at understanding their supply chain base, their sourcing base, and the risks associated. Obviously, COVID created all sorts of disruptions in the supply chain. But even before that, the governmental tariffs, at least here in the United States, uh, created significant margin pressure on businesses that relied solely on single countries of origin for their product. And so they had to make investments in diversifying their supply chain. Technologies allowed them to do that. So at, so now what we're seeing is this, so this sophisticated marrying of uh, understanding the customer's demand signal, which retailers can do better than ever before. Uh, tied into a much better visibility into their supply chain and how they can dynamically source product. And that's put retailers in a, in a much more powerful position to achieve their sales objectives without risking or even tying up as much of their working capital and, and inventory or risking that and, and, and the inevitable markdowns that you know always experience at the end of the season. So I think that's a, that's a pretty exciting area. I think the second area that's really exciting to me is what I would say the the ability of retailers to monetize their data. Obviously, they're monetizing their their data around customer to drive sales. But increasingly, retailers are able to monetize the data they have about their customers, and their first-party data that they're acquiring in those customers, and actually sell it to brands. Now, obviously, there have been leaders in this for decades. Walmart is a, is a clear leader in this. Um, you know, Target, Kroger, uh, we did it at Family Dollar. Uh, where you you take your POS data, you package it up, and you could actually sell it to brands. Now, brands would use that to get a much better demand signal because that's actually point of sale day. You know, going back 20 years, uh, 20, 30 years, retailers have been doing that. What we're seeing now is retailers are actually auctioning off their digital properties and making them available to brands to advertise. And the retailer owns the first party data as to who clicks that digital ad, you know, how effective is it? And did they buy the product? And once again, they're able to sell that ad space, if you will, to the brand. And then the brand uh, will see the efficacy of that investment through uh, the, the sales data that the retailer controls around that consumer. So uh, what you're seeing is what used to be true for the biggest brands in the world, like Walmart and Google. You're now seeing that, the, that it's somewhat being democratized, and even mid-tier brands are able to monetize their data, not just to improve their operations and their sales and their profitability, but also to generate revenue that's not related specifically to the sale of a product. Josh, with your experience as a CIO of a major company, as I talked about in the introduction, you were engaged in some major acquisitions, huge ac acquisitions. Would you talk a little bit about the integration of systems? Because, you know, we always see, when you see M&A occur, uh, integrating the IT systems post-acquisition is always one of the big challenges. What 
And I know you've done it successfully. So what advice do you have? Yeah. Um, for starters, there's, there's no playbook on how best to do this. Um, every situation I think is a little bit different. In my experience, two companies of approximately comparable revenue, uh, one acquired the other. Dollar Tree acquired Family Dollar. But, but uh, the store count was pretty close. Uh, the sales volume was pretty close. And both had populated uh, their application portfolios to support their, at the time, were 11 to $12 billion businesses. They both built out fairly robust IT application portfolios and infrastructures. And so when I, I started the process, I think as anybody would, you start to think a little bit about, well, who's got the best one of this and the best one of that? And we found that we really had a, a Noah's Ark situation. We identified 120 different types of business applications, and only seven of them were from the same company. So we had all these different choices in the portfolio. And I think it's a natural inclination, and I certainly started this way to think about, well, which, is, which of the two is the best? And I think what you find is, is actually what should drive the decision-making, and this is what we came to pretty quickly, was what's the organizational strategy? Which, which team is going to, is going to um, survive the integration of the two companies? Where is it going to operate? What pro product were they using? What technology were they using previously to support their business? It's often easier for a company that's been using a product, a technology product for a number of years to incorporate the changes associated with an acquisition than it is to try to get that team to change wholesale what it's using to support their former business as well as, uh, as, as the acquired uh, entity's business. And so that's what we ended up doing. So we went down the a path of, of um, having the IT application rationalization strategy mirror the organizational rationalization strategy. We started at the core with finance. We moved out into HR. Then we began to move into other back office operations like real estate facilities, energy management, which are a big deal, obviously, to retailers. And then uh, the way that company had chosen to operate was... Um, banner concept with the shared services core. So once we aligned on a common set of technologies for the back office shared service, then the question became, well, when you look at the banners, and there were three distinct banners in Canada and two in the United States, what technologies are supporting those businesses today? Are there any synergies actually in combining them onto a combined platform? And if there aren't, it's okay to leave them in se as separate because the, um, in, in some cases, the cost and disruption of consolidate and the risk associated with disruption as well as, as the, op the operational challenges associated with that um, lead to a cost that's greater than the savings of eliminating one of the two or one of the three applications. And so that's the, the, what the choice we made for field operations. But we were able to consolidate systems in the back office, um, HR, finance, procurement, as well as supply chain. But for field operations and stores, uh, we chose to leave those platforms separate uh, for the time being because, candidly, the, the businesses of those banners were quite different. The procurement, product procurement strategies, absorbent strategies, the point of sale transaction set were, were very different despite the similarities in the name. So I think to sum up, what I would say is um, your IT strategy should and your consolidation strategy should mirror the business strategy. If it's a significant company acquiring a tidy company, that's an easy decision. But the smaller entity will be absorbed and you will use the technologies in a significantly larger entity. If it's a, if it's a quote unquote perceived merger of equals, it's never really a merger of equals. What you find is that a, an organization or a, a leadership team is going to be chosen to lead that company forward post uh, merger or post acquisition of a, of a significant subsidiary. And your system strategy should mirror the strategy and operational capacities of that team. So we have been talking about trends, mergers, just there's so much going on right now in um, the retail value chain. And I say that broadly speaking, um, to include the manufacturers, transportation providers, et cetera, et cetera. So what 
capabilities are most important for modern retail IT organizations, and how should they be structured? Yeah, I'm going to answer that question uh, by saying that the most important thing are the people, right? It's it's very tempting to say what type of toolkit you need to have, uh, what sort of skill set you need to bring to the table, um, but I think the reality is that, that technologies are changing very quickly, uh, and there is a, always a risk of obsolescence if you if you play, place all your your chips on one particular set of technologies or a particular product set of products. So um, the way I think about it is the most critical function in an IT organization is really the business liaison function. There's a There should be a group in the department that works day in, day out, hand in glove with the business departments, operationalizing the strategy, the roadmaps that I mentioned earlier when you asked about overall capital governance or strategic governance of the department and its initiatives. And that uh, that group should work very closely with their team of the business to be that liaison back to the development uh, and operations and support parts of, of the IT organization. Uh, that's the most effective way to be sure that, that technology is supporting, driving, and enabling business strategy as varied and changeable and volatile as business strategy might become. I think the second key discipline to have in in IT is how do you take existing technology uh, that the company has, and every uh, uh, established company has legacy technology, how do you support and maintain that and drive down the cost of supporting that over time? The only way for you to take on new technology to support as a business without deleveraging the total cost of IT within the cost structure of the organization is by driving down the cost of what you have today, which means either retiring legacy technology, making it cheaper to support, uh, and make it cheaper to operationalize, make it more efficient to run. There's a lot of different techniques you can use. But the key discipline of the, of the IT operations organization is not status quo. It's not stability. It's actually driving down the support obligation and the cost of of existing technology so that new technology can be absorbed by the enterprise as without deleveraging the cost set. Well, based on what you just said, I would think then that the role of the CIO is probably going to be changing in the future. And I'm wondering, how do you see it changing in the future? And what skills, mindsets, does a CIO need to succeed? Yeah, it's, it's, so it's a great question. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, it, the, the role has certainly evolved from being an automator of back office processing, right, to uh, a strategic enabler of, of sourcing and procurement and, and marketing. Uh, and, and of course, some of those technologies have now uh, diversified and democratized to be actually led by some of these other business leaders. I would say the CIO still owns a unique role and position in the enterprise in that he or she is looking broadly across the entire enterprise. And what I'm seeing is all companies are becoming digital companies and all products and services that companies sell are being digitized. And so increasingly, what I'm seeing is the chief information officer is really becoming a chief product officer, hmm. because whether it's a shipment, whether it's a transportation company, uh, whether it's a merchandise company, a lot of these companies are developing digital assets that go along with the product or service being sold by the company that enrich the product or service sold by the company, not just versus competitors, but actually often creating unique data sets that create new avenues, new revenue potential for the enterprise. And so increasingly, the, the CIO is becoming a much more front office, you know, customer facing role in these enterprises uh, in order to uh, uh, productize digitally a lot of what enterprises were sell. That is a very interesting answer. I, I remember one of my favorite Wall Street Journal articles from 2011 uh, was um, by uh, Mark Andreessen, 
it was called uh, Software is Eating the World. Do you remember that? Mm, I do. It, 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 it's got to be one of the most famous editorials. Uh, but the way you described this process, this evolution, you really see that coming to fruition. But also the concept of a product manager or product management you know, there's still a, a lot of need in industry for more of that kind of a skill and capability. Um, but I hadn't really thought of it, the fact that the CIO needs to really have that kind of a mindset. But it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and you, you actually see the need for it based on the trends uh, that are occurring. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I would just use it as an illustration. Even if you're a cash and carry brick and mortar retailer, in order to create digital assets and digital opportunities for brands to sell, we talked about retail media companies earlier and data monetization, first party data monetization. That brand, in order to do that, that's a CIO that does it. The CIO is creating those opportunities for the company. It is turning the enterprise, the CIO, he or she is turning the enterprise's data into a product to sell. Right, the product is is used internally to and should be used internally to improve operations, drive revenue, and increase margin. But it can be packaged and sold externally, and many many retailers are doing that. But you even see this in other industries with with you know uh, consumer goods companies that are selling products. It's very difficult to buy, you know, a car, a refrigerator, a piece of sporting equipment, a set of golf clubs, for example fishing rod without having there be some sort of digital follow-on to that opportunity. What you know, the, the stepping off point there is to keep you as a customer and to track you post-purchase. But increasingly what we're seeing is as companies are developing creative ideas to create a digital product to sell on top of the physical product that they've sold. Transportation companies are doing the same thing with with uh, with their supply chains and the data that they're that they're uh, gathered in for their customers, both the uh, the shippers as well as the, the end customers. So based on your investing experience and work, what types of products do you see as most promising in the retail value chain? Yeah, I, I, well, it, it would be uh, really cliche to say artificial intelligence, but I, I think it would also be foolish if I didn't say artificial intelligence. And I think there's real entry-level business cases of it today that are uh, really exciting. I think computer vision can transform supply chain and store operations in significant ways. There's a lot of buzz and energy around autonomous checkout, the, you know, the Amazon Go stores and things like that. I actually don't think that's where the biggest opportunity is. Um, I think that's a, a sort of a, a sexy idea. People like it. But retailers have had self, have had self checkout, barcode enabled self checkout, for 15, 20 years. Um, I I don't know that AI at autonomous checkout is going to save them that much more in incremental labor. When you think about the the inherent shrink risk that 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 exists that exists with self checkout today, barcode enabled self checkout, as well as where is the savings? Um, you're not saving more labor than self checkout. Um, are, are you saving money by not putting a barcode on the product? I don't. I don't think so. Uh, not to, not significantly. Uh, so I I think it's a very interesting idea. It has some very good specific use cases where it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think for general broad retail, it's still got some significant problems and, and friction to to widespread adoption. However, in a much more controlled environment, think about a distribution center or a manufacturing facility. We're thinking about the store operations themselves. Um, the cameras can anonymously monitor human activity in a closed ecosystem and provide insight. And humans can't look at thousands of hours of video and draw meaningful insights. But artificial intelligence can. And it can aggregate data. And what used to take manual counting, like a cycle count, can now be done with computer vision. You know, you, retailers for a couple of decades now have sent people down the shelf, 
counting outs and lights, outs and lights, outs and lights. Well, they miss product. They miss all aisles sometimes. The person calls in sick today. In a significantly faster time, cameras can do that, aggregate the results. It, it reduces the spend on store labor. It improves, improves the quality of the outcome. Customer heat mapping has existed now for 10, 15 years. That gives retailers insights into what the way customers shop the stores and where they should put product. I mean, I think a computer vision and distribution center can be used as well for cycle counting. It can be used for yard management and it can be used for receiving. And these are all things that are possible and capable today that will save labor, reduce shrink, and improve numbers. Uh, and, and those are all enabled, computer vision enabled by artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as you move further up the the value chain, you're starting to see people use artificial intelligence to replace the algorithms that they developed maybe 10 years ago. So think about artificial replenishment excuse me, automated replenishment. Automated replenishment's been driven by algorithms that measured retailers now for a couple of decades at least. I mean, I think I put my first system in place in the mid-90s that was based on algorithms. Well, those were um, somewhat monolithic, universally applied. Those same data sets, historical data, as well as th you know ex external syndicated data can be fed into artificial intelligence. And, and it can be demonstrated that the forecasts that lead to the order points can be better than, and, fa and, and demand signal can be recognized more quickly with AI than what you were able to do with algorithms in, algorithms in the past. I mean, it used to take us with algorithms, and we thought they were pretty good and pretty accurate, um, a good four to six weeks to register demand on a SKU store basis and respond to that with future words. Uh, it can be done much more quickly now to capture lost sales and address out of stock conditions more more quickly. So let me just just pause there and I, I, I think generative AI, uh, I'll just close by saying is really just scratching the surface. You're seeing people use it uh, for marketing use cases and um, uh, you know analytics use cases like help me understand these results I've received, you know aggregating results. but I think over time it will be used for custom facing functions much more, uh, commonly, I think it will be used internally by enterprises to generate content and generate insights and lead operations. So I think AI is 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 pretty exciting where it's going. It's exciting what's happened in a year since we're we're just about at the anniversary of uh, Open Open AI publishing uh, 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 Chat GPT for for public consumption, uh, and and I think things will continue to grow and evolve much more quickly and large scale enterprises, which can be slow and adoptive technology will uh, will pick this up, I think, uh, more and more quickly. Josh, you, you mentioned self-checkout. And I know you were involved in self-checkout from the beginning. Um, as a user, I was an early adopter. I, I've always kind of gravitated towards it. But it's, it's improved so much over the years. Uh, it, it's really remarkable. And, um, you know, especially uh, the Walmarts that I shop at, I mean, it's it seems like it's seamless to me. It rarely, rarely do I need any help. It's just seamless. It used to be there was a lot of intervention that occurred. But I've noticed that some other retailers I've gone to, um, even successful retailers like Aldi, it's still not quite there. So... It seems to me that it varies a lot by retailer, even though overall the technology's improved. You've you've been able to witness this, is that right? That's right. And, and during my time at, at Dollar Tree, we did install self checkout in Dollar Tree and selected Dollar Tree locations uh, that that operated in a very similar manner to what you'd see in a, in a grocery grocery environment. Barcode enabled customer self checkout, and it was a very successful initiative. And we were able to manage the shrink associated with it. I think the varied, you see varied experience with self-checkout for a few reasons. First is not everybody's using the same technology provider. There are several players in space. Uh, and I think um, uh, there is varied experience with those players. Uh, secondly, the, a retailer's assortment and operations are different. 
And so depending upon the nature of the product that's brought to the front of the store that the customer tries to do self-checkout with uh, uh, can vary the experience, uh, uh, the ease with which the customer is able to navigate it. So your experience at, let's say, Walmart at self-checkout might be different at Lowe's uh, or Home Depot, not because the technology is different because they may very well use it from the same software and hardware company, but what you would see is the, is the merchandise and your ability to navigate that. Now, is every one of those products barcoded? Are those barcoded ac- Are they barcoded accurately? Is it age-dated product? Uh, um, you know, where are you in a particular municipality that requires um, that that a a, uh, a ID be scanned to buy the product? And that, by the way, that's not just alcohol. There are cities where you actually have to show an ID to buy spray paint uh, and things like that. So, so and and obviously, there's pharmaceuticals add, adds some further complexities to it. So. Uh, and I and I say, and I would say now, of course, Walmart has all of those categories of merchandise I just described. But to your point, I think they've got one of the smoother operations. Um, what what uh, you couple that with is discipline training around the support organization, which is obviously the people that that staff those lanes. It's the people that prepare the product to go through a self checkout line. That really starts with the supply chain, right? Is it um, is it safety uh, uh, like uh, shoplifting coded? Right? Can it go through the lane if it is without setting off the alarm when the customer walks out the door? Is is the barcode accurate? Is the barcode legible? Um, all those things are actually addressed in supply chain, and then store operations actually owns the end to end customer experience through the lanes and navigating that. So it's the orchestration of the of the assortment, the preparation of that assortment by the supply chain and the merchants, the way that the technology is configured. Uh, and, and potentially who that technology comes from, as well as the retail, the retailer in the store operating that technology to support support the customer. So it's it's a complex orchestration. And if you, add, if as I was saying, if you were to add um, camera experience to it uh, uh, around identification of the item, you could uh, risk further uh, slowdowns in the lane. I think what's what what's not broadly understood is even in those uh, uh, demonstration stores where their scan and go technology is implemented or autonomous checkout, um, uh, camera, and computer vision enabled point of sale. There's a lot of unrecognized items that are actually um, shared with humans on the back end to identify, correct, and continue. I didn't know that the artificial intelligence. Yeah, so there are uh, now over time, and it can take 8, 10, 12 weeks to train the AI to recognize some of these items. Well, there's new items coming into your assortment all the time. Uh, now, the autonomous checkout doesn't help you with age-dated, age-required uh, product. Uh, it, uh, it it certainly uh, doesn't help you uh, with, with product that doesn't fit under the camera, right? Imagine, you know, these like 24 packs of, of paper towels and things like that, it's pretty tough to run those over, over the autonomous checkout. So uh, there's uh, there's much to be worked out there. And as I was pointing out earlier, there isn't all that much incremental gain. Where where are you saving money? Are you going to save more labor than you that you already have a four to one or a six to one ratio between the lanes and the cashier supporting the self checkout lanes? Are you going to have none? Then I think you're going to have problems at point of sale and an increase in chocolate. So you're not saving that way. Okay. Are you actually saving that much on product packaging by not having it barcoded? I don't think so. I don't think that's an incrementally, incrementally dramatic or significant savings. And what I am seeing retailers do, and Walmart is a good example of this, is they do use cameras in their self-checkout lines. And they use it to um, monitor um, uh, for shoplifting for customers that are either inadvertently or intentionally not scanning items, um, customers that are um, keying in that it's, uh, you know, that it's a banana when it's not a banana that they're buying, uh, et cetera. They're catching that stuff. And sometimes they're actually demonstrating that video to you as the customer, as a deterrent. Uh, so, you're under- so that you actually understand that your actions are, be- are being filmed and might be, uh, might be deemed questionable. Um, by by uh, by someone. So 
So I think that uh, there is a proper role for computer vision in checkout, uh, but I don't think a truly autonomous checkout environment is possible in most retail locations. If you're in a closed environment, think a, a corporate, um, a, a dining room, a commissary, or something like that, where um, computer vision actually could recognize the customer because everybody's photo is taken because they're an employee of the company. They work there because they have badged access, let's say, to the building. Uh, so computer uh, vision could understand it was you. You picked up this item. That item was a you know, soda or a snack out of the commissary uh, and then charge it for it. Um, there are use cases for it. Uh, uh, and those you see today, I think in a, a general public retail setting, it's still very, very problematic. And I don't know that the incremental value is as high as, as where AI can be used, and, and particularly computer vision enabled, uh, AI and enabled computer vision uh, can be used elsewhere in the organization. I would think AI computer vision could also be very helpful in just understanding how customers are shopping categories in the store. Because, you know, is it the kind of category where they walk up to the middle of it and they look around um, or do they just kind of scan as they're walking by and where are their eyes going? I know there are eye tracking uh, technologies out there, but but also around, um, I wonder if AI could be used to understand consumer reactions to stockouts. Um, in other words, you know, because we really don't know how consumers respond to stockouts on the shelf completely. You can infer it a little bit from the data, but you don't know if they, you know, did they switch brands? Did they switch sizes? Did they just skip it? And, um, or did they, you know, leave their basket and go to another store? There's, and, and, but that's, it's so, um, it seems to me that it would be really important to understand what the consumers are doing because then you could have a better idea of what the cost of being out of stock on an item is. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And some of that technology has been in place for a number of years. Uh, we had a handful of stores uh, at Family Dollar where we put a large number of cameras in those stores. And we would set the, um, the schematics or the end caps, the platygrams or the or the end caps um, with with new product offerings from uh, from brands. Now customers would shop those stores thinking they were shopping a regular family dollar store, but the cameras would track their activities. Longness, right? We weren't. This was you're not trying to know it's Matt or it's Josh, right? Uh, necessarily, what you want to understand is: did they walk in that part of the store? Did they look at the item? Did they dwell in front of the item? Did they pick the day, the item up? Uh, you know, and then you marry that with the point of sale item for that time frame when that person was in the store. Uh, and that technology has just gotten better and better and better over the years. In fact, you're starting to see companies talk about, you know, how in the digital world, uh, Amazon is a, is a clear leader in this space. Walmart does it as well. Many brands do it. You understand whether somebody clicked it and whether they bought it. And if they didn't click it, what did they buy? Or you know, what did they buy if they didn't buy it? Because uh, that all of that is understood uh, in terms of the way you navigate the screen and what you click and what you end up going on a purchase. Uh, you, companies are beginning to talk about and um, capturing that same level of data accurately in the brick and mortar space and monetizing that data as well uh, back to the brands, much the way they do in their digital channels today. Is that that's well, Josh, this has been so interesting. Thank you so much for taking time uh, to visit with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's been a lot of fun. If you're finding value in this podcast, we greatly appreciate your support by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Additionally, following us on Apple and Spotify and leaving up to a five-star review would be immensely helpful. We welcome any feedback or questions related to the podcast as well as suggestions for further topics and guests. You can leave your comments on our YouTube channel and rest assured that I will read each and every one of them. Please also take a moment to check out our podcast sponsors as they play a critical role in keeping this podcast running. For more information on specific topics, timestamps, 
or links to articles mentioned during the podcast, head over to mattwallerpodcast.com. <laughs>